Yeah. Uh, I was in Singapore in January and uh, riding a taxi into Singapore. A uh, taxi driver and I had a conversation about political system and what's going on in Singapore. And the taxi driver realized that I'm not from Singapore. He mentioned that to outsiders, Singaporeans may seem to be free and corrupt, corruption free. But he did mention, we do have corruption. And most Singaporeans do know that we have legalized corruption. <laughs> so can you elaborate on that, please? <coughs> Uh, okay. Should I answer that, or do you want to answer it? Uh, the taxi driver said Singapore. I know, I know, yeah. I know. Do you, you want me to answer that? I can no, answer that. Okay. That, yeah. um, I think. <coughs> okay, to, to give us proper context, right? Um, one of the things Lee Kuan Yew learned very early was that, it, you know, um, learning from uh, the British, right? Uh, from the British governors, uh, from his discussions with the Colonial Secretary, is that if you pass laws to uh, make something legal, then you can always say, look, we are acting in accordance with the law. <laughs> so that's why, you know, given his overwhelming control of, of government, he inherited these tools from the, the uh, uh, Malayan emergency, which allowed him, you know, detention without trial and so forth. Um, and he also learned how to use the law to legalize, um, you know, his actions. And so in that context, when uh, the PAP wanted to drastically uh, you know, increase the, the amount of um, money they were accruing, uh, they instead of you know, doing as other uh, countries in the region might have done, like Marcos, and stealing it, although Marcos also was very clever, he used a lot of financial instruments, right? He learned a lot. Uh, but Lee Kuan Yew simply changed the, the law to increase the salaries um, that uh, accrue to the government. Right, so that's the most direct example. But then you have other examples. For example, um, HDB conveyancing, right? Uh -huh. uh, it requires a certain amount of expertise. And funny enough, for a long time, the only firm that had that expertise <coughs> was Lee and Lee. Yeah. So for every HDB flat sold in Singapore, yeah. you know, they gained uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars, right? And you think, how many HDB flats are there in Singapore? So uh, the, um, the way that uh, town councils work today, you, uh, I, I think maybe Kenneth knows better, but you, know, you need a certain num amount of expertise and there are only a certain number of people who can provide that, who happen to be, uh, you know, these companies happen to be owned by relatives of the government. So you see, what you do is you don't need to steal the money. You instead regulate, right? And then the only providers available then happen to be uh, companies owned by politicians, by key politicians, by ministers, by their relatives. So it's all above board. It's all transparent, you see. So and then when they bid, they're the only bidder because they're the only one who can meet the qualifications. So it's all, you know, it's all encoded in the law. And that works because it's predictable, right? Um, it's, there's no underhandedness. International capital knows how it works. It's, it's, it's stable. So that's, I think that's what the taxi driver means by legalized corruption, that the law enables this. Uh, unless you think it's not appropriate, can you continue, can you uh, uh, talk about your own yeah. uh, issue, right? Where they curb academic freedom in the context of historians, right? Um, okay. Right? Um, I think just just briefly, because I don't want to take too much attention away from Dr. Poe, but the last time the two of us sat side by side in Singapore to present something, the police showed up in response to a complaint, right? There was never any complaint, but uh, they they had to turn up to intimidate the uh, the public, and that ha that happens every time I speak in Singapore. You know, the police will show up. So uh, you know, and even just getting a venue, as Dr. Poe said, is impossible because you will book some somewhere, and then the police will call up that the venue owner the night before and say, "Oh, we are concerned about security," and then the venue owner will get the message, return our deposit. Um, with regards to historians specifically, there's plenty of ways to manipulate us uh, under the table because academia uh, needs funding, right? So you deny promotions, you deny grant funding, you deny appointments, you know, so you warn that if, if you continue on this path, then you're going to be starved of the oxygen that you need in order to get your work done. 
Uh, and then as for myself, of course, uh, I can't work in Singapore. It was made very clear to me uh, as my contract with NUS was coming to an end that I would never be able to get a contract with any of the uh, universities ever again because, you know, the, um, the government was very concerned about my work and anyone brave enough to hire me would soon find that, you know, maybe funding would be reduced and this person, this dean, might have, you know, another 50 people to think about, right? He has to think about his department, his university, their funding, and all these other jobs depend on him. So why would he stick his neck out to hire one historian uh, when there's all these other people that he needs to take care of? You see, so because um, uh, the heads of the universities are government appointees, because the government controls so much funding, because there's all this, uh, there can be all this pressure exerted behind the scenes. We don't see this out in public, right? And and also this avoids then giving us ammunition. So I can't go to you know UNHCR or something and say my rights have been violated because all this is by phone calls. But I have, you know, had conversations with uh, administrators, with the director of my department, who quite frankly told me, look, that's it, you're done in Singapore. You have, you know, you'll never be able to work here again. So you know. Uh, there's at least four or five of us banned, you know, um, and and we we just can't work in Singapore. There is there are empty p uh, history positions in the National University of Singapore, which the government is unable to fill because any time they try and find a historian of Singapore, that person then, for some inexplicable reason, <laughs> insists on being a historian who you know uh, wants their work you know validated, authenticated, who who wants to. Be a, a professional historian with uh, you know who produces work which is of international rigor instead of churning out stuff which the government wants them to churn out. So you know they, they just can't find people to to they just can't find historians in Singapore and and the ones that do, uh, for example, are on uh, teaching contracts so they have to be there, right? Uh, they they have been subsidized by the government so they have no choice but to come back and and teach Singapore history. But then the syllabus is dictated by the government and there's only so far. And you know, there's um, th th it's, there's a, a level of sophistication here because you know you can say things in private, you can say things to an academic audience, and the government won't come after, won't come after you. But it's the the public stuff. You know, it's my public lectures, it's uh, my videos, my podcasts. Those you know, the government came after me very strongly for. You know, Lee Hsien Long uh, called me a fraud. He said I had made up this whole story just to get my PhD. Right. Uh, Bilahari, Ambassador Bilahari, Ambassador Chan Heng Chi, you know, they've attacked me uh, as a revisionist historian, as someone who uh, is irresponsible, who cherry picks his facts to delegitimize the government who has a political agenda. So, uh, you know, as many of us historians who've uh, lost jobs, lost funding, uh, we have to work outside of Singapore. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, the, that's, that's how, that's the reality of the situation. Right? So, you know, that's how it works.